On behalf of my colleagues at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's lecture, the third event in the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, sorry, the fourth event in the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies online lecture series, uh, which as you know, um, will be presented by Laura Cleaver and Danielle Magnusson, who will be, um, they, they will be introduced momentarily by Laura, um, Lynn Ransom, pardon me. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it. Uh, my name is Dot Porter, and I'm the curator of digital research services in the University of Pennsylvania Libraries with a dual home in the Schoenberg Institute and the Kislak Center. SIMS, as we call it, is a unit of the Kislak Center in the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. Guided by the vision of manuscript collector and longtime patron of digital manuscript work at Penn Libraries, Lawrence J. Schoenberg, the mission of the Schoenberg Institute is to bring manuscript culture, modern technology, and people together to bring access to an understanding of our shared intellectual heritage. To that end, we aim to make our resources, programs, and data available to scholars and students around the world. We invite users at all levels to use and contribute to projects such as the Schoenberg Database of Manuscripts, directed by Dr. Lynn Ransom, or VizCall, which I and my co-director, Alberto Campagnolo, direct together. We also invite people to freely use manuscript data available in open, our fully open access repository of metadata and manuscript images. You can find out more about these and other projects that we are leading or collaborating on by visiting our website at schoenberginstitute.org. In addition to making data available to the world, we also seek to bring scholars to Penn to study our manuscripts through a visiting research fellowship program. While our fellowship program is on pause this year due to the pandemic, we'll be starting it back up in 2022 with a new call for applications. And this fall, as we have done every year since 2008, we will host the annual Schoenberg Symposium on Manuscript Studies in the Digital Age. This year's symposium will be on the topic of loss and is scheduled for November 18th through the 20th. So be sure to get that on your calendar. In addition to these programs, we will also publish a bi we also publish a biennial journal called Manuscript Studies. If you're interested in submitting, please feel free to contact us at any time. We're actively seeking submissions for two issues in 2022. We're also delighted to be able to host and co-host events such as today's lecture and to be able to do this virtually and to include people who wouldn't be able to come to a lecture on our campus. If anything good has come out of the last year, that is that the virtual lecture and conference format has enabled a much broader and richer opportunity to share knowledge with co colleagues around the world. Before handing the screen over to Lynn, I do have a few housekeeping items to share. First, we'll be recording the presentation and then posting the video to the Schoenberg Institute's YouTube channel and announcing it on Twitter and Facebook. And please do follow us and share the post widely once it's up. Amy Hutchins is going to be monitoring the chat during the talk. So if you have questions along the way, please go ahead and type them in. And at the end of the lecture, she will pass those questions along to our speakers. So without further ado, I will hand the screen over to Lynn Ransom to introduce our speakers. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Dot, and hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to, uh, to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Laura Cleaver and Dr. Danielle Magnuson. Dr. Cleaver is the Senior Lecturer in Manuscript Studies at the Institute of English Studies and the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. Before coming to the Institute of English Studies, Dr. Cleaver held the position of Lecturer in Medieval Art at Trinity College, Dublin. <clears throat> and she has published widely both on art historical topics and in the field of manuscript studies, including her 2018 monograph, Illuminated History Books in the Anglo-Norman World, 1066 to 1272, and Education in 12th Century Art and Architecture, Images of Learning in Europe, circa 1100 to 1220, which was published in 2016. More recently, Dr. Cleaver's interests have turned toward collecting in the trade of medieval manuscripts, in Europe and North America in the early 20th century. In 2019, she received funding from the European Research Council for the project Cultivate Manuscripts, which aims to assess the significance of the trade in medieval manuscripts for the development of ideas about the nature and value of European culture in the early 20th century. 
As the director of Cultivate Manuscripts, Dr. Cleaver leads a team of researchers, including her co-speaker, Dr. Danielle Magnuson. Dr. Magnuson joined Cultivate Manuscripts after completing her doctorate at the University of Washington in English Literature and Textual Studies. She then has since lectured and taught at the School of English at Trinity College, Dublin, as well as participated in the project Migrant Books, Western Manuscripts, formerly in the Chester Beatty Collection. Her current research grew out of this work on the Chester Beatty Project, including an essay published last year and co-authored with Dr. Cleaver entitled American Collectors in the Trade in Medieval Illuminated Manuscripts in London, 1919 to 1930, J.P. Morgan Jr., Alfred Chester Beatty, and Bernard Corch Limited. This research has been extended through her particular project on the Cultivate Manuscripts team, which centers on the network of collectors, dealers, and scholars that contributed to the golden age of American book collecting from about 1895 to 1930. Spinning off of this research, Dr. Dr. Cleaver and Magnuson will consider from their two perspectives, what these networks reveal about the motivations of American collectors and the nature of the response of the British public to this transfer of their cultural heritage. Please join me in welcoming our speakers, Laura and Danielle, over to you. Thank you. A cartoon by Bernard Partridge published in the British magazine Punch in 1922 depicts the fictional American Uncle Sam with a Shakespeare first folio under one arm and Gainsborough's The Blue Boy under the other. The choice of items was inspired by recent purchases at London auctions by the real Americans, Henry Folger and Henry Huntington. In the cartoon, Uncle Sam stands next to Shakespeare's grave with the nervous ghost of Shakespeare behind him. The caption reads Autolycus, USA, a reference to Autolycus the trickster and snapper up of unconsidered trifles in Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale, inspired in turn by the character of the same name in Greek mythology. Reading the famous inscription on Shakespeare's memorial that curses anyone who moves the bones, Uncle Sam declares, now that's real disappointing. I'd set my heart on that skeleton. To which the ghost of Shakespeare replies, but all the same, I should feel more comfortable if it was insured. The cartoon forms part of a long running tradition of presenting American collectors denuding Britain of her most precious cultural treasures at almost any cost. However, it is unusual in hinting at deception rather than simply the power of American money in the presence of which concerns about British culture had a tendency to become as insubstantial as Shakespeare's ghost. In this paper, we will examine the transatlantic trade in rare books and in particular, pre-modern manuscripts from two perspectives. First, I will argue that the creation of American libraries in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was seen by Americans as a triumph of both economics and discerning taste. Although Americans bought books from many places on their European travels, London was a very important center of the book trade. And some Americans, notably Huntington and Folger, were particularly interested in acquiring English material. At the same time, the activities of American collectors were framed as salvaging a heritage that was being poorly cared for in Britain, as books left damp in drafty English country houses for a new life in specially built American libraries, whether in New York or California. Unsurprisingly, the British saw things differently. So for the second part of this talk, I will hand over to Laura who will present the view from Britain. She will examine the concerns raised in Britain about the exodus of national treasures, which tended to focus on the idea of an American threat. However, despite considerable debate in the British press, no action was taken by the British government to try to prevent exports before the Second World War, a decision that contrasts with the activities of other European governments. The interests of British sellers were given precedence over those seeking to make a claim for cultural heritage. And the interest of Americans in British books was also presented as a form of soft power to Britain's advantage. The combined activities of British sellers and American buyers 
facilitated by dealers on both sides of the Atlantic, therefore enabled large quantities of rare books of particular kinds, including Shakespeareana and illuminated manuscripts to find new homes in America. In 1923, the Philadelphia and New York based dealer, ASW Rosenbach told Publishers Weekly, it is now dawning upon us that we have been living in the most wonderful period of opportunity that book collectors have ever had. Just two years later, cultural arbiter H.L. Mencken would write a grim assessment of book collecting in America. Mencken was described by Walter Lippmann in the 1920s as the most powerful personal influence on this whole generation of educated people. In 1923, Mencken's influence peaked with the founding of the American Mercury, a magazine which remained a sign of intellectual respectability for more than a decade. So when Mencken wrote about book collecting in the American Mercury in 1925, it would have reached a highly receptive educated readership. In his article, he describes the corrosive influence American collectors had on the wider book market, on Anglo-American relations, and even on scholarship itself. Mencken explains that the books that the agents of American profiteers now, now gobble so copiously in London are not merely old books. They are in some cases national, national treasures of the English people. Some of them are quite unique. When the single known copy comes to America, there is none left for England. Mencken warns that even when such books reach our public libraries, they are not where they belong. They ought to be in the libraries of England. England produced them and England ought to have them. To set up any contrary doctrine is to argue that there is no such thing as a national treasure, that everything belongs as of right to whoever offers the most money for it. Mencken argues for a more equitable market, writing, Englishmen would buy them if Americans kept out of the market, that American gold vulgarly flashed runs up prices beyond reason, and so makes it impossible for men of ordinary means to compete. One of the main problems Mencken identifies is that the sort of Englishman who collects books is poorer since the war than he was before. The sort of American who invades the London auction rooms is enormously richer. His presence is a constant affront to English sensibilities. He, vid Sorry. he visualized the superior wealth of the Republic, the only country which made a profit out of the war. The English may be polite to him, but they detest and despise him in their hearts. He is to them simply a barbarian on a raid. Not only does Mencken describe the situation as having an evil effect upon British American relations, but he presents it as a particularly undesirable for the American collector who, quote, as a rule is extravagantly anglomaniacal. He craves English goodwill. Mencken goes on to argue, and I will quote here at some length, that the relations would be better if the sales were not so public and the superior solvency of the American bidders not so boldly flaunted. Above all, if there were any logical reason for bringing such treasures to America, there is none that I have been able to discover. America did not produce them and Americans in general are not interested in them. Save as things costing a lot of money. Moreover, there are very few scholars in this country capable of studying them to any profit. The overwhelming majority of such students are Englishmen and live in England. Yet more, there is no sign so far that the profiteers who buy them have any intention of putting them at the disposal of such scholars as we have. Now and then, true enough, a Morgan Library is opened or is announced that a Huntington Library is to be opened at some vague time in the future. But in the main, the profiteers hoard their loot very carefully and so it has no public value, whatever. Finally, Mencken suggests, the thing that makes news is not the fact that another unique example of incunabula has come to America, 
The news lies in the fact that a prodigious and unprecedented price has been paid for it, that all possible English competitors have been knocked out by an American who is willing to pay twice what the book is worth for the childish satisfaction of grabbing it and hoarding it. The collections of such men are not, properly speaking, libraries. They are simply safe deposit vaults full of sunbursts. I've taken Mencken's article as a starting point here for a number of reasons. Because of Mencken's influence, because it demonstrates that collecting could be divisive in America, because it highlights how collecting captured the public's interest, because of Mencken's focus on England, and finally, because of the extent to which Mencken's views were shaped by headlines. Thanks to the work of early 20th century journalists, novelists, and critics, the American public was familiar with the spectacle and nature of intensive art collecting, and they were fascinated. How We Strip Europe of Her Treasures of Art became a popular subject for New York Times articles, and authors such as Henry James and Edith Wharton featured collecting prominently in their works. Nonetheless, plenty of American collectors would have failed to recognize themselves in Mencken's description. He is certainly not describing a collector like George Plimpton. But the main reason I've included Mencken is because of his final accusation that American collectors guarded vaults of sunbursts. Considering the cultural importance of their libraries, we know relatively little from leading collectors themselves about their personal motivations to buy specific items. Henry Huntington, for example, rarely granted interviews, and J.P. Morgan burned 30 years worth of letters, which could have offered incalculable insights into his collecting. Others were secretive about their purchases overall. However, however it is still possible to detect a narrative forming around American collecting in the early 20th century. It was a narrative created in the full light of publicity, newspapers, magazines, and literature, that suggested that the best American collectors were instinctual collectors, sentimental collectors, and collectors infused with a strong sense of purpose. Scattered throughout various publications of the period and promoting further acts of rescue buying were stories of Europeans unwilling, unable, or uninterested in preserving their own cultural heritage. One example comes from the 1911 sale catalog of the American collector Robert Ho. The foreword written by Beverly Chu begins, Mr. Ho once told me on his return to Europe of a visit he had made to one of the great libraries and his feelings of surprise and disgust at the utter lack of reverence and appreciation he found as shown in the want of care given to the great monuments of printing. The catalog of this library was rich in the masterpieces of the early printers and when he asked for them, Volume after volume was brought to him covered in dust, with leaves stained and bindings broken, and in every way proclaiming the effects of indifference and neglect. And how did Ho reply? This, he said, confirms me in the conviction that those who love books should have them in custody and will take the best care of them. Chu specifically mentions English literature, stating that Ho was always eager for English literature and spared neither time nor money in a tireless quest for the original editions of the authors who make our language great. Adding that, it may well be a cause for regret that many of its treasures may find their way back to the old countries from which he brought them. Of all the anecdotes Chu could have selected, it is interesting that he chose this for his portrait of Ho as a collector. And we find many versions of this story from the period where Americans alone can liberate and safeguard items of historical significance and where in some cases, collectors felt it necessary to save England from the English. Deference to English heritage was a fixed and accepted formality for many early 20th century American collectors. In fact, English visitors to America often commented on the Anglophilia that they encountered the talk of a shared heritage of English speaking peoples. Rupert Brooke declared in 1913 that America was, in cultural terms, utterly dependent on England and that America is still our colony. John Erskine wrote a little later that history made it natural that England should be our tutor. Even as late as 1917, as Anne Douglas has observed, 
there were only two English professors in the entire nation who specialized in American literature. The rest focused on English literature. The pull of Englishness explains the emotive investment in English heritage shown by some collectors. Morgan was honorary president and trustee of the American Scenic and Historic Preservation Society, an influential organization whose annual reports monitor the condition of historic properties in America and Britain. These reports make clear the society's, the society's position, quote, traditions of blood relationship give to the people of the United States a peculiar interest in the movement to preserve the landmarks of Great Britain. The organization was particularly interested in the fate of Soul Great Manor, the ancestral English home of George Washington. In 1902, the New York Times began warning that the home was not being properly maintained. It seems that a family crest was missing from a window, an effigy of Lawrence Washington had been beheaded, and the main structure was decidedly more dilapidated than picturesque. Ultimately, the manor was purchased and given to the American people in 1914. Following World War I, when Britain became heavily indebted to the US, however, the society felt that Americans were entitled to greater access to historic monuments overall. The society reported to New York State legislator in legislature in 1918 that when the war is over, Americans can go to Europe and look at the cathedrals, the sculptures, the frescoes, the paintings, the libraries and museums, and with no little justification, speak of them to a European jointly as ours, not simply yours. The interwar years brought to America an even greater awareness of its responsibility in preserving the artifactual world. But we see this passion for material conservation even in earlier works, like Edith Wharton's 1913, The Custom of the Country, where the quasi-villain Elmer Moffat has more than a little in common with Morgan. At the end of the novel, Moffat becomes the greatest American collector, one who buys only the best who pursues some remarkable French tapestries. They had been kept in such damp conditions that, as one American observer points out, they smell so of rain. The French family is devastated at having to sell them and see nothing wrong with the condition in which they are kept, having done so for generations. But Moffat's redemption as a character coincides with his moving the newly purchased tapestries into a purpose-built space in Paris. In the presence of these art objects, Moffat has an intensively emotive response, morphing from Machiavellian businessman into someone touched by the spring of some choked up sensibility for which he had no language. Who, when he talks about his collections, you could see, quote, his expression change and his eyes grow younger, almost boyish, with a concentrated look in them that reminded one of long forgotten things. Moffat represents the American self as a series of purchases. When he buys well, he redeems himself partially. When he connects on an emotional level with his purchases, he redeems himself fully. We also find rescue buying in Edward Newton's 1918, The Amenities of Book Collecting. Even as Newton romanticized book hunting in London, he makes a point of associated, associating English bookshops with grime and inattention. He describes Bernard Quaritch's famous shops as a cold, dingy little room filled with priceless volumes in an old shop in Piccadilly. He recalls having ransacked the wretched little shops to be found in the by streets of Holborn, and that the book lover's happy hunting ground is the Charing Cross Road. It is a dirty and sordid little street. He also writes that, at 27 New Oxford Street West is a narrow dingy little shop, which you would never take to be one of the most celebrated bookshops in London, Spencer's. And in a statement that would resonate with many of his contemporaries, Newton states, I have always loved London, London with its wealth of literary and historic associations, with his countless miles of streets lined with inessential shops, overflowing with things that I don't want, and it's grimy old bookshops overflowing with things that I do. 
Antiquity is the source of England's appeal and its limitations. As Erskine commented, whatever advantages can be derived from doing the same things over and over again, always in the same way, these advantages the English have. Almost in reaction to accusations of wasteful American spending, English collectors and dealers were repeatedly depicted in the American press as being overly casual, even careless. Rosenbach wrote in his essay for the Saturday Evening Post, Why Americans Buy England's Books, that perhaps the traditional Englishman has been so accustomed to seeing about him the finest things of art and literature that in the course of years, he becomes a trifle bored. In a telling example, the New York Times reported in 1931 that the Vincent First Folio had been lost to view for 250 years in Cannage Hall and was discovered on top of a case in a coach house covered in dust, missing a cover and tightly tied with rough cord. A member of staff quite literally threw the folio down remarking, it is no good, it is only old poetry. Now the book is safely tucked away in the Folger Library. A similar anecdote took place in 1923 at one of the Britwell sales. Rosenbach was able to purchase a small 17th century book for 51 pounds that was in reality at the time worth closer to eight or 9,000 pounds. Of all the dealers present, Rosenbach alone was able to realize that the book had been printed in Cambridge, Massachusetts, not Cambridge, England, making it the first volume of verse printed in North America. And Newton recalls purchasing in London a bundle of dusty volumes in an old bookshop in the Strand for two guineas. As it turns out, one of the volumes happened to be Wordsworth, per, Wordsworth's personal signed copy. In contrast, Newton writes, don't expect ever to discover anything at Rosenbach's except how ignorant you are. Even Henry James' popular 1911 novel, The Outcry, centers around an English aristocrat who doesn't properly understand the art in his own house. This in spite of the fact that James's novel was intended to be a critique of American collectors, specifically Morgan, not a celebration of American consumerism. Not only were American dealers and collectors depicted as fully appreciating the books and art objects they possessed, but it was made abundantly clear that they knew how to properly house them. American libraries were not associated with grime, just the opposite. They were depicted as incredible orderly shrines to civilization itself. Harold Stearns reflects this in his 1922 Civilization in the United States, writing that the great wilderness of the past has been explored with diligent care and the material lies carefully classified in those literary museums, which we call libraries. American readers appear to be fascinated by these new expensive structures. In the case of Morgan, for example, it is tempting to say that his library received more publicity than the collection inside. Described as gleaming with rainbow colors and light, in 1906, the Wall Street Journal declared the Morgan Library the most perfect example of architecture in this country. It is intended to be a treasure house. Adding that, it rivals anything in Europe. No other building in Europe or America was ever erected with this care. When the Folger Library was built, a New York Times article reported that, in actual architectural fact, it is a bridge from one civilization, or perhaps more accurately, from one historic tradition to another. Newspapers often noted the incredible state of preservation of rare books in American libraries and the exhaustive efforts to keep them safe. When Jack Morgan opened the Morgan Library to the public in 1924, he told reporters that preservation was his main priority, stating that, quote, my great principle is to make these things permanently valuable. A statement suggestive of the degree of agency he felt over the value and survival of these objects. He was also clear about limiting access to the manuscripts, stating that one soiled thumb could undo the work of 900 years and a misplaced cough would be a disaster. Despite the levels of neglect Ho's books had apparently suffered in Europe, once in New York, according to the New York Times, they appeared in the finest possible condition and state of preservation. 
And when it is remembered that vellum written books were almost all produced previous to the year 1500, the perfect preservation of those in his collection seems little short of wonderful. A 1910 New York Times article referring to Ho as a custodian of his treasures describes how his books were kept. The books were in nine rooms, quote, sacred to Mr. Ho and his librarian. No one else had keys to the rooms and no one else save the housekeeper who came into dust once a week was allowed to cross the threshold. So Mencken's use of the word vault is hardly accidental. A 1913 New York Times article in the Morgan Library claims that the most precious things in the library, however, are the manuscripts. They are in a room that is actually a safe, burglar proof and fireproof. One enters by a thick steel door fitted with a combination lock and the walls of the room are of steel while a steel shutter protects the window at night. It has all been so cleverly done that nothing but the door indicates that one is in a veritable vault. A description of the Huntington Library in 1932 mentions, the very rare books are kept in a vault and the new manuscript racks are of steel. All natural light is excluded and temperature and humidity are carefully regulated. A 1922 New York Times article on the library notes that the books will be forever guarded from all but the most urgent need. While a 1930 Huntington Library exhibition catalog tells visitors where to stand outside the library to see the entrance to the vault. And when the New York Times introduced its reader to the Folger Library building in 1931, it included, beneath and around all these Elizabethan properties are the efficient devices of a more modern age, vast steel vaults with intricate combinations where the most valuable books, books and manuscripts will be locked away. Similarly, the journey of Folger's books from New York to DC is described with this headline, Folger's books moved by armored truck. And the article highlights that this journey included five guards. Sometimes it was even felt necessary to guard books from scholars. The New York Times reported in 1923 that Archer Huntington had locked a manuscript in the vault of the Hispanic Museum in New York when a scholar working on it produced controversy. That same year, the New York Times quoted Sir Sidney Lee on how Folger made his collection inaccessible. Quote, he seemed to think first folios ought to be put in bins and cellars like first vintages. I hope now that America has gone dry, other American collectors will not attempt to fill their empty bins with first folios. Lee was not granted access to the collection in the end. These American collectors were truly portrayed in the media as guardians of their books. And this arrangement was generally accepted, perhaps because as Stearns wrote in 1922, art purchases make the newspapers, but art is not a part of everyday life. Now, security measures were not unique to American collectors, of course, but it is interesting how they infiltrate the narrative of American collecting. Americans may not have produced the medieval manuscripts they collected, but they could safeguard them in uniquely American ways, hidden in new steel purpose-built structures surrounded by rapidly growing urban centers. At least within public rhetoric, the drama of buying England's rare books had begun to serve as a symbol for modernity, the triumph of American business, architecture, and consumerism. And accompanying this was an increased sensitivity to the power of these books as objects that could excite emotive loyalty. And the more sacred the books grew, the stronger those steel cages needed to be. Beneath this push to safeguard cultural treasures was a prevailing sense of urgency. Rare books truly were conceived of as transient sunbursts. For good reason, the word acceleration appears often in the writings of contemporary social commentators. As Douglas explains, acceleration was the trademark of American life, the most valuable asset any society could possess, at least in modern times. But as early as 1880 at the opening of the new Met building, Joseph Choate told an audience, which included Morgan, think, think of it, ye millionaires of many markets, what glory may yet be yours if you only listen to our advice to convert pork into porcelain, grain and produce into priceless pottery, the rude ores of commerce into sculptured marble, 
and railroad shares and mining stocks, things which perish without using and which the next financial panic shall surely shrivel like parched scrolls. It is interesting how these two images are linked in their temporality, disappearing millions and shriveled parched scrolls. The leading American collectors did form massive libraries in relatively short bursts of frenetic buying, and the media was delighted with this. As Frederick Allen Lewis said at the time, the country had bread, but it wanted circuses. In reality, of course, early 20th century American book collectors were incredibly varied in their personal strategies, motivations, and collecting goals. But as Mencken makes clear, the American public was made far more aware of a cohesive muscular narrative of rescue buying, one that celebrated American consumerism and methods of preservation, and one that Mencken clearly found offensive. According to this narrative, national treasures weren't being raided from England, books that had survived for centuries were at risk, requiring American vaults more than private English libraries. This was only the responsible thing to do. And in this way, public rhetoric hampered the image of the greedy American collector. As a 1927 Scribner's article declares, due to the heavy responsibility of collecting, it can hardly be denied that Mr. Huntington has amply repaid his indebtedness to the rich resources of England. And with that, I am now going to hand over to Laura. Thank you, Danielle. Unsurprisingly, the view of the transatlantic trade in rare books from Britain looked rather different to that presented in the American press. As in America, debates about the importance of rare books and manuscripts played out in British newspapers and journals, and we can glean further insights from unpublished correspondence and sales records. As early as the 1890s, opinions were divided over whether growing American interest represented a threat to Britain's cultural capital or an opportunity for a lucrative trade. Underpinning much of the debate was a recognition that Britain's treasures not only included works that had been made in Britain, but also those acquired by earlier tourists who had returned with rare books and manuscripts, as well as those obtained in the context of empire. Yet shifts in attitudes towards America are also discernible over the course of the period. At the turn of the century, concerns about American purchases of rare books were expressed both publicly and privately, but went largely unheeded, in part because plenty of material was available. In the years around the First World War, American dealers such as George D. Smith contributed to new auction records and ensured that these were well publicized. But British reaction was relatively muted, reflecting changing social attitudes to elite collecting and the economic realities of funding a major war. By the end of the war, the dominance of wealthy Americans was inescapable, but British sellers continued to benefit from this and commentators enjoyed the spectacle of record sales in the auction room. In the economic depression of the 1930s, Britain still looked to America as a major market for rare books, but also sought to consolidate London's position as a key marketplace in the international trade. Just as Americans were not only buying books in Britain, so America was not the only or even the main destination for books sold in Britain during this period. However, American purchases attracted disproportionate attention, in part because of the publicity sought by dealers such as Smith and later Rosenbach, and in part because no case could be made for these works as being returned to their region of origin. Strikingly, despite much hand-wringing in some quarters, no government action was taken before the Second World War to try to control the export of rare books and manuscripts, allowing market forces to determine the fate of individual items. Mencken's 1925 article in the American Mercury, arguing that English books ought to stay in England where they could be properly studied, might have been expected to find a receptive audience in Britain. However, at least one English reader publicly disagreed. Writing in The Sphere, Clement King Shorter, himself a collector, produced counter-arguments, claiming firstly that a great many of the books sold to America come back to England. Some books certainly did return, although the claim that a great many did was probably an exaggeration. 
On a visit to Rosenbach's shop in New York in 1920, the director of the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, Sidney Cockrell, identified six illuminated manuscript leaves as the work of the Oxford artist William de Brailles and persuaded the American, Alfred Justabisi, who was funding Cockrell's trip, to buy them for $6,000 or about £1,200. Beatty, who divided his time between Britain and America, but whose collection was housed in London, brought the leaves to England and in 1932, with the aid of the National Art Collections Fund, now the Art Fund, Cockrell was able to obtain them for the Fitzwilliam for £3,500. In 1932, the London Times deemed their acquisition by the Fitzwilliam poetic justice, declaring that but for the action of the National Art Collections Fund, these masterpieces of early English art would almost certainly have returned to America when Beattie's collection was put up for sale that year. As the leaves did not come to auction in 1932, we will never know whether they would have been bought by an American collector. But the Times' article was part of a commonly expressed belief that by that time, the wealthiest collectors of such books were Americans, and if they wanted something, they were unstoppable. Among Shorter's other points in response to Mencken's argument were that a great many of the books sold in England do really get into English libraries, which was certainly true. Indeed, in 1920, one commentator had observed in the context of Rosenbach's purchase of the Stowe papers for Huntington, that even if Britain could buy such things, where to store them would pose a problem, as the public record office is getting too small, even for our state documents. Finally, ignoring the case made in the American Mercury article that most students of rare English books are Englishmen and live in England, Shorter sided with the British sellers. He declared, my own feeling with regard to book collecting is that we are one people and I do not much mind whether a book is in California or is in Middlesex. I am just as likely to ever to see it at Pasadena as I am in Bloomsbury. In fact, I have been in Pasadena within the last 10 years, and I've not been in, that, in the British Museum during that period. Ignoring the views of those who did frequent the British Museum, he continued, so far as Americans have raised the price of rare books, I am rather pleased. Now and again, they've put a little money in my pocket. That prices for some material had risen significantly is indicated by the fact that in 1901, the de Brailles leaves, then not identified as such, had sold in London for just £390. They were bought by the London dealer Quaritch, and that firm's commission books indicate that at that time, the British Museum had been prepared to spend £200 on them, and the Fitzwilliam Museum just £30. Significantly, however, although the leaves were in New York by 1920, in 1901, Quaritch was not bidding on behalf of an American client, and it seems instead to have acquired them for his own stock. Annotations in the commission book suggest that Quaritch offered the leaves to the British Museum for £390, but that they declined to buy them at that price. By 1901, the idea of Americans raising prices in the sale room was well established, but at that time it was often without foundation. At the sale of part of William Morris's library in 1890, one reporter attributed high prices to the spirited bidding of the gentleman who is said to be buying for America. Yet although Americans were present, including Henry Wellcome, who had made a fortune from pharmaceuticals and was resident in London, and Benjamin Franklin Stevens, who exported books to America, the highest prices were in fact paid by British-based collectors and dealers. Similarly, the London-based, though German-born, Bernard Quaritch held bids at the Morris sale on behalf of Americans, but the results were generally modest. For example, John Boyd Thacker of Albany, New York, obtained two lots for a total of seven pounds and three shillings. Spending on a larger scale, Robert Ho bought two lots through Quaritch for £360.16. shillings. But his outlay was eclipsed by that of the British collectors Lawrence Hodson, whose bill from Quaritch for the items bought at the Morris sale came to £1,069.19, and Henry Yates Thompson, who paid the highest price for a single item, £350 for the Sherbrooke Missile, you can see here, an early 14th century manuscript made in East Anglia. 
while Americans contributed to the bidding, therefore, there is no evidence that their, their presence significantly increased prices at this sale, let alone putting material out of reach of British buyers. At the same time, books from Morris's collection left Britain via Quaritch for other destinations, including Paris and Leipzig, without prompting any comment in the press. Although a few books were lost to America at the 1898 sale of Morris's library, in 1902, J.P. Morgan bought a significant part of his collection as part of his purchase of the library of Robert Bennett, a bleacher of cal cal calicos and chemical manufacturer from Lancashire. This prompted a lamentation in the London Times, in which the author asked, can nothing be done to stem the continuous and wholesale exportation of rare early printed and other books and illuminated manuscripts to the United States of America? The drain has been going on for over half a century. Within recent years, it has reached huge proportions. And now we have the mournful privilege of chronicling the, the most important single transaction which has occurred or perhaps is likely to occur in connection with this subject. The sale was deemed to be particularly significant, both because of its size, about 700 books, and the nature of its content, which included illuminated manuscripts and early printed books, among which were 32 Caxtons and the most expensive of Morris's illuminated manuscripts. The author of the Times article judged that the formation of another such collection scarcely comes within the range of the possible, even granted half a century and an unlimited amount of money to attempt such a task. This was a remarkable conclusion, given that Morris had acquired most of his medieval manuscripts in the last five years of his life between 1891 and 1896. But it finds echoes in other concerns that the abundant supply of rare books on the London market in the 1890s was beginning to dry up. In this, the author's view was to prove overly pessimistic, although the Bennett Library was not the last major collection to cross the Atlantic in a single purchase. In conclusion, the Times's correspondent bowed to American financial power, declaring it is little short of public calamity for the collection to pass out of this country. But unfortunately, in these matters, there is no such element as sentiment. The man with the biggest purse gets the prize. Yet the article's final sentence offered a glimmer of consolation. If English collectors will not avail themselves of such unique opportunities, it is, at all events, comforting to reflect that, as in the present instance, the collection is in the custody of an English-speaking nation. The pain of geographical distance was perhaps to be soothed by an idea of cultural influence associated with a shared language, a sentiment echoed by Shorter's claim in 1925 that the Americans and British were one people. Even more soothing, to British sellers and dealers at least, was the money Americans brought to the market. Although only a relatively small part of the British auction market in the 1890s and the first decade of the 20th century, in 1911, the sale of the first part of Robert Ho's collection provided a very public demonstration of American economic dominance in the market. That sale took place in New York, attracting European buyers, including Bernard Alfred Gorich, who wrote to the Parisian bookseller Edward Rahir, I hope that the books will not sell high so that in future they may send their libraries to Europe for sale. It was not to be. George Smith, bidding for Huntington, dominated the sale. On the first day, Smith bought a Gutenberg Bible for Huntington for a new record price of $50,000 or £10,000. At the end of the first sale, Belle de Costa Green, Morgan's librarian, expressed her frustration at the disruption of the old order in the New York Times. She claimed, buyers have come from all over Europe and are getting nothing. Things have been raised to a fictitious value. In fact, the Europeans did not come away completely empty handed. The New York Sun reporting that although George D. Smith continued to take a majority of the offerings, Bernard Quaritch insisted on having a share of the best lots and took several books at high figures. However, there was now no question of the rest of the sales being held in London. Moreover, as Quaritch's clients at the wholesale included the Morgan Library, a purchase by the London-based dealer did not necessarily mean that the books were destined for Europe. 
By the time of the First World War, there could be no doubt that American buyers were obtaining desirable books in large quantities from Britain. In the summer of 1914, Smith came to London, once again prepared to spend large sums. In July, the New York Sun reported that he had spent almost $100,000, about £100,000 in a few weeks. In addition to his purchases, Smith was driving up prices for some books. On the 9th of July, at the sale of part of the Hooth Library, he was the underbidder for a quarto of King Lear, published in 1604, which was sold to Quaritch for £2,470 for Folger. The Pall Mall Gazette reported that this more than quadruples the record at Sotheby's for a quarto play and exceeds all but the highest sums ever paid for a first folio of Shakespeare. Smith courted publicity, sending bulletins to the American press promoting his success in London. He claimed that, that, but, that by paying high prices, he had succeeded in breaking up the ring. This referred to the London dealer's practice of not competing for items unless they held commissions for them. A second auction would then be held in a local pub to establish what the group thought the real price of the book was, dividing the likely profits between them. In 1914, Smith's presence deprived the group of a large amount of stock and increased the prices they had to pay for some books, though it certainly did not end the practice. Moreover, in setting new records, Smith potentially increased the prices that London dealers could ask for items in their own stock. In addition, despite the press's focus on high prices, Smith also quietly obtained a large amount of stock for sums that were not obviously above the London market rates. His presence, therefore, had a more nuanced impact than was suggested by the headlines. Smith's impact on the London trade can be measured in the remarkable case of the sale of the library of Parker Mayhew Pitter. 207, sorry, 702 lots were offered for sale in November 1918, when Smith was not in London, but many failed to reach the desired prices and were bought in. In these cases, a fake name was recorded as the buyer together with a price, presumably that at which bidding had ceased. These items, together with a few books that had been returned and additional items uh, that weren't included in the first sale, were offered at a second sale in December 1919. Smith was present this time and bought 180 lots for a total of £4,072, 10 shillings and sixpence, including 169 lots that had appeared the previous year. In total, Smith did pay more than had been offered the previous year, spending £1,008 and 10 shillings, more than the recorded prices of 1918. However, the expenditure was uneven. In 53 cases, Smith paid less than had been recorded the previous year. And in a further 12 cases, he paid the sum at which the books had failed to sell in 1918. The overall total was, was swelled by 16 books for which Smith had paid at least 20 pounds more than the earlier figures, including a 16th century collection of grammatical works for which pay, Smith paid 175 pounds more than the 60 pound figure recorded against the item in 1918. High sums could only have been achieved by competition from another bidder. But the inconsistency in prices may suggest that by this time Smith had reached a truce with the London dealers who were not obviously bidding up items. Although Pittar's estate did benefit from Smith's attendance to the value of at least £1,008 and 10 shillings therefore, the sale is a reminder that the presence of an American did not automatically result in high prices for every item. In addition to auctions, Echoing Morgan's purchase of the Bennett Collection in 1902, Smith bought parts of the library of the Dukes of Devonshire in 1914, followed by the library of the Earls of Ellesmere, the Bridgewater Library, en bloc in 1917. Although the buyer was initially kept anonymous, it was soon reported that the Bridgewater Library had been acquired by Smith at a price stated to be over £200,000 or a million dollars. The sale was reported in the British press with very little protest, although the loss of English books was noted. The Guardian declared that 
There is reason to fear that the famous Ellesmere Library has gone the way of so many precious books, English books and pictures across the Atlantic. However, as the Tatler, which was also edited by Shorter, put it, it's rather awful, isn't it, that the glorious Bridgewater Library should have had to go to America? But as the new owner, who's that greatest of book collectors, the billionaire Henry Huntington, is said to have paid Lord Ellesmere over £200,000 for it, well, after all, money talks and books don't say a word out loud. This combination of hand-wringing and resignation as the dollars flowed in set the tone for British attitudes in the following decade. As the market boomed after the First World War, concerns continued to be raised about the loss of national treasures and the National Art Collections Fund made its first contribution to the purchase of a manuscript, a lavishly illuminated Life of St Cuthbert secured by the British Museum in 1920. However, the importance of a small number of American collectors to the market for illuminated manuscripts was demonstrated in 1929, when the Luttrell Salter and the Bedford Hours were obtained for the British Museum using a loan from Morgan. This was a very clever gamble on Morgan's part, as if the museum failed to repay the loan, the manuscripts would be his and could leave for New York on the understanding that the British had failed to appreciate their national treasures, having been given every chance to retain them. Despite huge publicity, it was a gamble that Morgan very nearly won. And even when the money was raised, the positive light cast on Morgan made it difficult to protest against his library's other purchases over the following years. The importance of the American economy was felt in a different way with the Wall Street crash in 1929, which triggered a global depression. Despite the financial climate, America continued to be perceived as a key market for the sale of rare books, prompting the decision to sell the Marquis of Lothian's library, not in London, but in New York in January 1932. Following the familiar pattern, some protests about the export of the books were made in the press, and these focused on three manuscripts made in England. The observer opined that it will be a melancholy fact if no adequate attempt is made to keep, at any rate, the Blickling homilies and the Tickle Psalter in British hands, if not in those of the nation itself. Although the author noted that, at least so far as is generally known, no such attempt is being planned. Both manuscripts, together with an 8th century Psalter, also mentioned in the article, were bought by Rosenbach. And as you can see, the Tickle Psalter is now in the New York Public Library. However, the Times reported that the sale had raised about $100,000 less than had been widely expected, and there was no rush by British collectors to repeat the experiment of an American sale. In a review of sales in 1932, the Observer's correspondent declared, the most cheerful thing to report is that the year seems to be closing with a definite improvement in prices, especially for the smaller works of art and for books, which are now fetching a good 30% more than in the summer. At Sotheby's in July 1933, Rosenbach set another record price for a Shakespeare first folio with Gabriel Wells of New York as the underbidder. However, the recovery was slow and uneven. In June 1932, when Beattie sent some of his manuscripts to auction in London, prompting Cockrell to arrange the private purchase of the de Braille's leaves, many of the auctioned manuscripts sold for less than Beattie had paid for them or failed to sell at all. And the pattern was repeated at a second sale the following year. On both occasions, some manuscripts went to American collections, with five acquired for the New York Public Library. But the British Museum obtained one manuscript at each sale and other volumes were bought by British collectors. Although there was no return to the boom years of the 1920s, the London market was not replaced by New York sale. Indeed, in 1938, when the Mortimer Schiff collection was bought from America to Sotheby's for sale, the Daily Herald explained, better prices were expected on this side. Besides, collectors have greater faith in Europe's auction houses. The Daily Herald reported that at the sale, Rosenbach's agent found himself in competition with French and Belgian dealers, who, in spite of Europe's panic condition and the lowness of the franc, still considered rare books a better investment than gold. And so, despite the power of American money, 
London managed to maintain its position at the heart of the international rare book trade. The transatlantic trade in rare books and manuscripts flourished in the period from 1890 to 1939 because it was mutually beneficial. American collectors gained unique European books and created collections that explored ideas about cultural heritage while simultaneously constructing a cultural identity for the young nation. Qualms about the removal of these objects from their countries of origin were allayed by a narrative of American superiority, economic, responsible and appreciative. Even some British commentators were willing to acknowledge that these arguments were not without merit. Moreover, the Americans were continuing the tradition of the British Empire by enriching their nation with the cultural treasures of others. Although America became a pantomime villain in accounts of sales of British books, the reality was much more nuanced. American interest in certain types of books boosted the market for those, but overall Britain was hardly running short, although the argument that the British could buy books back proved overly optimistic. Moreover, British sellers were delighted to receive dollars in exchange for collections that were challenging to maintain in an era of increasing taxation and living costs. Similarly, British-based dealers may have been frustrated by the staging of the wholesale in New York, but they actively courted American clients. In the face of these market forces, the voices raised in protest were doomed to achieve little and occasional collaboration between American collectors and British institutions provided token gestures that helped keep the wheels of commerce well oiled. American collections grew, but Britain continued to be a major centre for the international book trade. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle and Laura. That I could sit for hours and listen to these tales of intrigue about the nitty gritty of uh, book dealership at, at this time. It's um, it's really fascinating. Um, I'm sure there are going to be questions coming up um, while people are thinking about what they want to ask. Um, I'm kind of interested, this is not necessarily the focus of what you're talking about, but how did scholarship change? You know, so, so scholars were both denied access to these treasures, but at the same time, they also learned, you know, they, they became more sort of apparent um, as things of interest to study. Do you have any thoughts on that? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll, Danielle has a think best, if you like. Um, I think, and, and this is one of the themes of, of our larger project. I think all of this ties together. Um, it's, not, it's not coincidental that Sidney Cockrell also writes a book about William de Braille's in this period. And, and you can really see um, collectors and scholars interacting in a way that is, is mutually beneficial. The scholars get access to to these collections, but then it raises the prices and, and that causes um, problems later on because collections that are now aware of the significance of, of six illuminated leaves by a known English artist from Oxford are now really priced out of the market because Cockrell's done the work funded by the collector, which is now means that, that BT can ask three and a half thousand pounds for them when um, 30 years before they've been worth apparently 390 pounds so so it does all it does all interact um, but it also means that you have you have certain kinds of material starting to receive attention which tends to be the kinds of things that um, are most popular on the market whereas there are still um, you know, in this period huge numbers of manuscripts that you can buy for less than a pound for a few shillings on the on the British ma ma market um, that nobody is is writing about um, and that are often sitting in dealer shops for years and years in the hope that um, a rich American will <clears throat> buy. <laughs> Danielle do you want to add anything to that? I, I was just going to say that um, there are certainly examples of collectors being incredibly generous to scholars, but it's it's just not as good a story. 
Um, and that's that's kind of the problem with the way the media coverage or covered book collecting at this time. The the better story, the more interesting story dominated that narrative. And so it's it does take a while to kind of pick that apart and try to get at the truth of what was actually happening and what that relationship between scholars and, and collectors and, and dealers actually look like. And so that's something that um, that certainly I'm looking into and that we're all kind of wor working on and looking into. I've spent a little bit of time lately looking at George Plimpton and, and he collected educational materials, um, textbooks. And he's an example of a collector who definitely would have been generous in um, allowing access to the materials that he collected. Uh, Folger was particularly resistant to allowing access um, to some of the stuff, he, to the stuff, he, the materials he collected. And of course, that makes a more interesting story. So that's gonna get a bit more press coverage than you know, one day, um, uh, you know, a medieval drama scholar was allowed access to certain materials. That's that's not quite as interesting to read about. Claire Kosliko, hi, thank you so much. I really enjoyed your um, kind of dual uh, presentation, giving both the British and the American perspectives on what was happening at the end of the nineteenth century and into the beginning of the twentieth century. Um, and it seems as though, you know, the, sa the sa in some ways it's the same story, but on one side of the Atlantic it's cause for celebration and on the other side it's, it's, it's cause for a lot of distrust and, and, and concern. Um, what I was really listening out for was whether the, uh, whether the press was going to critique the um, the origins of the great American wealth, um, how Folger and Huntington and Morgan made uh, their money and, um, and who essentially paid for that, which was of course the, the, the laborers um, in, on the railroads and in the steel plants um, and uh, digging for oil and so on. But I, I wasn't really hearing that. And I'm wondering if, if if that's actually the case, was there any critique or examination of of how um, the wealth was accumulated in order to then make these purchases? I think that's a really, really good point because <laughs> the bigger economic picture is that you you could say, well, actually, a lot of the sort of British country homes are having to sell off their collection because agricultural prices in Britain are slumping because. America's come on the scene and is now producing grain much more cheaply. And, and I'm not an economic historian, so so you know, I may I, I don't understand the full nuances of that. But nobody seems to make that connection particularly. Um, and the British the British attitude is, is quite resigned that that these things go in waves and and they had it good during the era of empire and now something else is going on and and they're really just interested in in making sure that they sort of hold hold their position, and then they play out this idea that well there's a sort of cultural soft power here because it's good for the Americans to want our stuff because then we establish some kind of never fully defined influence over, over what those are. Um, but I'm sure Danielle has stories of people like Carnegie who do get quite a lot of criticism in the press for the, the way in which they treat their workers. Although she's now looking like that was the wrong thing for me to say. Um, <laughs> he, I'm just trying to think at the time there was a bit more attention paid to the fact that he built library buildings but wouldn't fund the filling of the library he wouldn't buy the books mm -hmm. um they they certainly american collectors got attention for how they made their money but not in ways that we would expect or the ways we would now so people at the time were incredibly familiar with how jp morgan made his money how huntington made his money off railroads especially morgan morgan was you know, an important, of course, an important celebrity at the time. But, and there was certainly some criticisms of their, the business side of their life, but there wasn't that same connection with acquiring money in a certain way and then using it to buy um, items of cultural and historical significance. There didn't seem to be that much tension there, not like we would expect, not like we would maybe have today. 
the American, and of course I'm generalizing, but the American relationship to success that you see in a lot of contemporary writings, it was, it was such a positive celebration of success. Um, how that success was achieved, certainly people like Mencken and maybe Henry Adams would, would speak out and, and, and grumble about that. Um, and the, it is easy to find those, those kinds of texts and those kinds of comments, but overwhelmingly success was seen as a virtue and as a symbol of this growing nation, um, this growing economic power, and this idea that successful people are, you know, they're entitled to buy certain things. Who better to own these things than someone who's incredibly successful um, in a financial way, in a financial sense? So there is acknowledgement, but not like we'd expect. And again, in the example of Carnegie, yeah, there was there was certainly some awareness of the way that he, uh, the way he, his relationship with his workers when they didn't do things he wanted them to. Um, but again, that, that didn't, like so many things from the early 20th century, it doesn't play out the way that we would expect. Yeah, I mean, I, I noticed that with Mencken, there seemed to be just a little bit of a recognition of the sort of critique of, of monopolies that was also happening at the time. And you could also hear it in the language of the, of the vaults and also of steel, right? Steel is being celebrated in all of these ways. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in, in some sense, we, we could say that the, the collectors were quite successful in, in covering up what was happening in the larger um, economy with their philanthropic efforts philanthropic efforts of opening these libraries and then and collecting and making some of those items available to the public. So thanks, it's very interesting to, to hear your thoughts. We have a question from Mark Samuels Lasner. You'd like to unmute? These, these, were, these were terrific presentations. Um, you've taken me away from an exceedingly boring departmental meeting <laughs> <laughs> for which I am very grateful. Uh, I, I think perhaps one of the reasons why the British were not so critical of where Americans made their money was, of course, in Britain, the purchasers of books, aside from a few very rich aristocrats, were men who had made their fortunes in new money. And they were maybe not at the level of Huntington uh, or Morgan, but they were not um, traditional uh, gentry. Um, I'm thinking particularly of Lawrence W. Hudson, who purchased so many items in William Morris's uh, lot sale and commissioned Morris to decor decorate his house and was a patron of all kinds of artists and writers in the first decade and a half of the 20th century. Um, he uh, was a brewer uh, from Wolverhampton and that had no particular social cachet. Richard Bennett was a chemical manufacturer. Um, Harmsworth, Brotherton, um, Dyson Perrins, these were all people who had made their money in some kind of trade or business, perhaps no more reputable than Huntington and railroads or um, Frick and, and Carnegie and Steel. Yeah, uh, I think that's very true. I mean, the, the British really did not care where the money came from as long as it as long as it came in. And um, and they they certainly were not going to be in a position to to critique anybody, anybody else's uh, um, fortunes, because, again, um, many of the, the families who who'd amassed collections in the 18th century had had obtained their wealth through um, means that, that we would find extremely objectionable today. So, um, yeah, it, it, one of the one of the challenges in, in working in this field is that, that <laughs> yeah, the activities of, of rich people um, in all pre points of history um, are often uh, morally dubious, to put it mildly. Um, <laughs> but they um, Yes, and that's where the, the, the activities of the dealers are so interesting in terms of um, how they go out and actively court new collectors in this period in which there's a shift from, from old money to new money and, and encourage them to, to start building a collection. Um, and that, 
that really does put a lot of emphasis on both sides of the Atlantic, on, on the middlemen um, and the people who are facilitating this and, and letting this happen, or making this happen. So there is a, a couple of questions in the chat. One from uh, Rhonda, I can't see her last name yet, uh, but can you talk about the, um, Rhonda Mandel, can you talk about the Alice manuscript? We can. Uh, I'm looking at Danielle because so this is, this is um, the the record breaking purchase by Rosenbach of the Alice in Wonderland manuscript, which gets a lot of attention. Now, the reason that well, I think Danielle and I are both slightly hesitant is that we we come to this from the from the avenue of pre modern manuscripts. So that's what we mainly focus on um, things from about the period before 1500. But it is true that that I mean, that definitely wasn't just what the Americans were interested in. You know, there was also a huge market in Americana in this period, and in in modern in modern manuscripts as well, and in autographs, and in um, obviously Fifth of Folger, um, this wonderful category of Shakespeareana, where you see the the dealers recasting anything that might vaguely have something to do with Shakespeare as Shakespeareana. Let's make a lot of money out of this. Um, but yes, then again, I mean, my sense, I don't know if Danielle has a, has a sense of this, my, my sense is that this is yet another occasion where, where Rosenbach really exploits the, the publicity around this and the British do their thing of saying, oh gosh, yes, what a tragedy. Thank you very much for the dollars. Um, I don't know, Danielle, do you have a different perspective on that? No, I, I completely agree with that. Um, no, I think that I, I would have said essentially the same thing. And then Sandy Malcolm has a question. Sandy, you can either unmute yourself or I'm, I can ask it for you. Um, I'll go ahead and ask it. Is there any evidence that US or European dealers operated a ring in the way that the UK dealers did? It seems an obvious tactic, but only the UK ring ever seems to, <clears throat> to be mentioned. Okay. Oh. I am looking at I'm looking at Danielle. Um, I Europe I simply don't know, and, and we have other colleagues in our team who are working on on Europe right now. Um, Europe is a big is a big place with a lot of different a lot of different things, um, and and where there are very strong traditions. So in Germany, booksellers book dealers have to do an apprenticeship. Um, many of the firms are related um, by uh, hereditary descent or by marriage, and it's it doesn't seem to work in quite the same way. Yes, they are they are tied and working together, but they're doing so um, from a slightly different base. Um, in France, again, things are things are regulated by the government in a slightly different way. So um, I don't don't know of any evidence of them them operating in a ring. Um, and in New York, the auction market is is smaller and takes longer to get going. Um, it would not surprise me when we've when we've done a bit more digging to find that there were informal arrangements going on amongst the American dealers. Danielle's nodding and, and I'll ask her to say something in a minute. Um, but there is, with the American material, and again coming back to the difference between what the press covers and what actually goes on, there is this very um, <coughs> violent language in terms of the Americans. It's all about winning the fight, defeating the opponent. Um, so if they're then all meeting out the back and, and splitting up the spoils, they're disguising that really well. Is that fair, Danielle? No, absolutely. I'd say the same thing. Um, in the stuff that's published by American dealers about dealing in their memoirs and in the, the different things, the different public, contemporary publications. If a ring exists, they are not acknowledging it. Um, they kind of try to portray it as um, an industry dominated by a few big personalities, Smith, Rosenbach, um, Wells to some extent, Sessler. But I, I agree. I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't something happening behind the scenes, but it's certainly not acknowledged in materials either published at the time or a little bit later, um, people kind of reflecting on the early years of their 
career within the trade, working with Rosenbach and, and different individuals. So and the, the, yeah. the story is that it's personality driven and the ring doesn't really sync with that. Mm -hmm. But again, the story of American collecting is important. If you're a dealer, if you're a collector, or if you're just a member of the reading public, they want a certain narrative. Yeah. And the auction scene just isn't as big in New York. I mean, part of the, the reason that, that the British can, can get away with it is simply the sheer scale of the material that, that's coming through on a daily basis. Um, but we will find out more, hopefully, in the next three years. So come back and we'll, <laughs> we'll see if we've changed our opinion. <laughs> we'll have you back in three years' time then. Count on it. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Jean-Christophe Coutier, would you like to unmute? I don't see him or hear him. Um, so- Sure, I can unmute, sorry. Okay. I, uh, um, hi, uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, uh, so yeah, you opened with this really cool caricature. We've had then uh, Uncle Sam's got this painting in one hand, he's got the manuscript in the other. I'm just wondering about that that battle of, of rising in value between you know art sales and manuscript sales. And it seems that you're touching on a moment when that starts to really shift. I know from you know Picasso and Gertrude Stein are buddies in Paris, and they talk about these things and what can we do to make manuscripts uh, sell for a bit more money or as much as your paintings, for instance. And uh, my sense, you know, I'm a scholar of a later period, post 45, and really that, for me, that really starts to happen with Harry Ransom and the University of Texas, where he starts to buy things at prices that no one had heard of, and that really screws everything up, including, of course, um, uh, manuscripts from the UK, so from, from their own uh, national heritage. Um, but... I'm wondering if in your, you know, in your studies, you're, you're, are you also tracing that, that difference between the two? And is it really this interwar period? Is it, is, it the, is it Rosenbach and Huntington that really start something? Or do they actually, is, is Ransom, sent, uh, Ransom actually just kind of late to the show and it was already happening? Thanks. <laughs> Great, Daniel, do you want to? Talk about it. <laughs> I, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. I think it was already happening. Um, and I actually think in some respects, Rosenbach was a few steps behind someone like Duveen. Um, these same individuals, the American market, these same individuals, Morgan Huntington, of course, they were collecting expensive art at the same time that they were amassing their libraries. Um, and they got way more press for the paintings that they purchased for the simple reason that they cost a lot more and they were absolutely unique. There, each painting was a unique um, object. And of course you could argue the same for medieval manuscripts, but they didn't have the same kind of cultural cachet. And uh, when you're buying a, you know, a certain copy of um, you know, Milton, the reading public would be aware there's more than one copy of that or you know, a Gutenberg Bible, but there, you know, that's not the only Bible around. So it was kind of harder, I think, for that American um, reading public to wrap their head around a, a unique example of printing a unique uh, book of hours, things like this. So there was a lot more interest in paintings um, and the paintings that Morgan collected and the paintings that Huntington collected and the record breaking prices that Duveen was able to orchestrate. And there is some sense from things written at the time that Rosenbach, especially with Duveen, felt a bit of competition over say Huntington's attentions. Um, because he would take breaks from the spending if he had bought heavily with Duveen, he might take a break from, um, he might take a break buying with Rosenbach. So there was a bit of competition there. There was, I've also read more than once that they didn't get on well. Um, so there was an, another level of the rivalry. So the, the two worlds collided, they absolutely collided um, between uh, art dealers who also, kind of function as interior designers for a lot of these same American collectors and um, book dealers. Um, so it was, they were competing over the same clients. They were competing over um, their attention, their time, their efforts. And there is some evidence that they borrowed each other's tactics, trying to get dealers to appreciate a Vermeer and then appreciate a certain um, medieval manuscript and invest heavily in those. 
but the American public was always more aware of the art buying um, than, than the books. And the outcry is about that subject, about paintings and um, Americans buying things for record-breaking prices and, and stealing national treasures, and how can this be stopped? And the only thing I'd add very quickly on that, because I know we're nearly out of time, is that, that what you really do see is different kinds of material booming at different moments, even within you know, books. Rare books is a huge and diverse field. And the only, we're doing quite a lot of work on, on the economic side of things. So again, come back in, in a couple of years and we'll be able to give you more facts and figures. But um, I did a little bit of work just looking at what happened to William Morris's collection. And basically the things that, that sold for reasonably high prices in 1898, then rose dramatically in price after that. And the things that didn't, didn't move in price at all um, before the First World War. So again, you've got these, these sort of sense of um, trends and particular things explode at particular moments, usually because somebody or two people, because it takes two people to, to have an auction battle, are interested in them. And then particular, particular things can explode. Thank you very much. Um, this has been a wonderful uh, hour, hour and a half. And as Caroline Schimmel notes in the comments, these kinds of stories are still happening. There's some a kerfuffle on the Ex Libris listserv about uh, the Bronte manuscripts that she's referencing. So, so again, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming. Enjoy your weekend and see you. We will not have a, a, a lecture in July, but we will start back with, a, I hope, a full roster of lectures um, in August for, for uh, the remaining year. All right, see you, everybody.